this is perfect. Thank you, Kim, You're for welcome. that segue. This is an absolutely perfect segue <laughs> to really talk about, I think, a kind of a quasi new kid on the block, which is Neratinib. And it's, you know, been around. And I'll tell you, to be honest with you, I mean, over the years, you know, I think it's kind of been a little under the radar for a lot of us. I think that, you know, at least my opinion, what was, it, it really was kind of lapatinib with more diarrhea. Mm. But I think we really have a lot of very, very exciting data that is very head-turning. Um, I think the Nefertiti trial, which was published in JAMA Oncology a few weeks ago, for me, I think was really a turning point in my thoughts about this drug. Does anybody want to take on the Nefertiti trial? Joyce, you want to talk about it? Um, yeah, it was a, a large randomized trial of first-line trastuzumab plus um, paclitaxel versus paclitaxel with neratinib, and it had equivalent PFS. Um, and the um, incidence of progression in the brain, development of brain metastasis, was about 50% less with the neratinib. But it was striking because the same exact trial had been done with lapatinib, right. uh, paclitaxel, and it was substantially inferior. Correct. So, um, Correct. So it is as good as uh, trastuzumab. So that's not, not anything we've seen so far with a, uh, no. with a, a HER2 TKI, you know. So that was very, very important, as is the um, penetration to the brain. Yeah. So I think we've been a bit distracted by the diarrhea. That's a weird statement. But, um, you know, I think neratinib, from its very early days, had better preclinical data. Yes. It had better single agent HAL study with it as a single agent. I did a study in combination with trastuzumab. And at least my clinical experience is that this was a very different drug, long when it was owned by wife. You know, very early days, we saw patients who had received a lot of lapatinib, whether they had responded or not, and we gave them this drug. So I think it's definitely different. I think where we're trying to position it is where do we get the, that benefit translated to the patient and what setting do we use it in. So, um, I, you know, lots of things we give cause diarrhea. I mean, I think it's a huge hassle for the patient. It's a huge hassle for my nursing staff, my triage staff. Um, Let me just say a few, uh, a word about the um, diarrhea because the, um, there's an ongoing trial. Oh. I think it's called the 6201 trial. And um, there's already data emerging from it. And basically what it is, it's for the first, first 56 days, although the diarrhea is way down after the first even week. It's prophylactic loperamide emodium, and right. it's four milligrams TID for the first yeah. two weeks and right. four milligrams BID yeah. thereafter. Right. But if you actually look, what it boils down to, in the 40% who will get any diarrhea, so that means 60% will not get diarrhea, 13 to 15% will get grade three diarrhea, it lasts one day. And, and then it quickly tachyphylaxes. So it's really interesting, and it's pretty much gone by 30 days, although the prophylaxis continues for 56 days. So there's a lot of information emerging, and that, that data will go in with the regulatory submission. Yeah, and, and that be part was, of the label. Right. That was so, going to be my statement, which is it's a hassle, but we now know how right, to do it. Right, you say it's it. predictable. If you tell a woman it's predictable, controllable, and limited, I think if you can say that to people and mean it, and if it's really true, which it sounds like it is, I think it's something people can tolerate. I, I think would, that people I, worry about it. It's like it's going to be forever. Basically. I would add that the reason why you see more diarrhea than with yeah, neratinib than with lapatinib is because it is a better inhibitor of her. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Thus, the, uh, the data on the NEFER trial makes sense. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I agree with you. It's totally manageable. It's, totally, it's, profi it's, it's uh, almost abatable with, with prophylaxis. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's interesting, I think that uh, this happens to other targeted therapies, happens with EGF receptor inhibitors and rash. There's some adaptation of stem cells in the gut, in the skin, you know, and, and if cancer cells adapt, why wouldn't our own stem cells? Mm -hmm. right. So, so with patients learn how to manage it, and the body may adapt to these mm -hmm. side effects. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, to cut to the chase, I think we all now appreciate it. Um, a different drug than lapatinib, even though it has a similar side effect profile. But I think what we need to turn our attention to is really the data that's emerging, especially in the early stage setting, right. from whether you look at ISPY2 or the Extonet study, because I think we've gotten a little distracted comparing it to other small molecule inhibitors, comparing the toxicity. And I, I do think we should let the data speak for itself. So like, let us. Tell us about Extinet, yeah, since well, you brought it up. I mean, you know, the, the bottom line here is Extinet was a study where patients had completed a year of trastuzumab. We know that's always, for our patients and ourselves, we always, that's a hard moment, right? We're going to stop the TRAS, especially if they've had like a high PCR in the neoadjuvant setting. And we really don't know who 
to continue HER2 based therapy. For now, we stop it at a year. We're learning from the endocrine world that, you know, 10 years, and we'll learn later today that 15 years is better than 10 years. So, right. why would a highly effective therapy we randomly, I love it when George Sledge says, we picked a year of TRAS because that's the time it takes the Earth to cycle the sun. <laughs> that's something a George like that. Sledge like yeah. statement. So, I mean, the bottom line is we have data now that if you add a year of neratinib after a year of trastuzumab, it makes an impact on invasive disease-free survival. And the most impressive subset, and the number sticks in my head, is that we have an over 8% absolute difference in disease-free survival for women that got neratinib after a year of trastuzumab, 8%. So, you know, yesterday during the plenary breast sessions, we were debating should we give an anthracycline for a 2%, you know, 2.5% absolute difference in disease recurrence. And um, we're not supposed to look at subgroups, but that's what we do. <laughs> and right. we are <laughs> contemplating Zolota, a drug that has one out of four women will get grade three diarrhea in the adjuvant setting for, you know, somewhere between a 2 to 4% absolute reduction. So we have a drug when added after a year of trastuzumab results in an 8% absolute reduction in invasive disease events um, in the ER positive. And yeah. I think we have to start paying attention to it and just um, be fair, that put it in the perspective of other things we do for patients in a curable setting. So the one thing I've...